meeting started, so if you could take your seats, I'd appreciate it. My name is Bill Edgar. I'm the uh, president of the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, and I'd like to welcome you to the regular planning meeting of the uh, Central Valley Flood Protection Board. Today we'll be hearing some presentations. We're going to be briefed, and we'll then be uh, taking a tour of uh, the various sites related to the Corps of Engineers general reevaluation reports. You're going to hear the term GRR uh, a lot today, and that refers to the general reevaluation reports that the Corps is now doing for West Sacramento and for the other side of the river, uh, Sacramento. Um, these uh, planning and information meetings that we, the board has normally occurs the second. Uh, Friday of every other month, and our business meeting occurs every Friday of every month. Uh, probably the best way to keep up with our meeting schedule is to monitor our website. Now, thanks to the generosity of our friends at West Sacramento, we're meeting in the West Sacramento City Hall and in their council chambers. Uh, and for uh, this part of the meeting, it will be videotaped, and the highlights of the site visits will be and posted on our website next week, along with the PowerPoint presentations that you'll be looking at shortly. And I think Zach is our video photographer back there who is uh, doing the heavy work. And thank you. Again, thanks to our many friends in West Sacramento for doing this. And finally, thank you for attending this meeting. We appreciate your uh, attendance. I think at this time, uh, Leslie or Lucy or somebody ought to call the roll of the board, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice President Emma Suarez. Present. Secretary Jane Dolan. Present. Member Tim Ramirez. Here. Member Clyde McDonald. Here. Uh, members Joe Countryman and Mike Felines are absent. President Edgar. I'm here. Mr. President, you do have a quorum. Thank you very much. A few housekeeping uh, items uh, before we get started. Uh, first of all, with regard to the parking, uh, the tour participants uh, ought to make sure that you're in the overflow parking area uh, located uh, east of City Hall. Um, and it's not here in the parking lot or you're going to get a ticket. And if you have a problem with that, uh, Greg uh, Fabian will uh, help you out. Greg's sitting up here in the front room. Restrooms are located out the front door and to the right near the elevators, both this floor and the first floor. Uh, all tour participants are required to sign waivers. Nancy Moritz is in the back there with the baseball cap on. And she has the forms if you're going on the tour, you need to have those signed. Um, and then everybody just should sign in on our um, uh, sign-in sheet that we have available. Uh, and the staff can help you with that if you have a call. Uh, one other last question. This is a non-smoking tour for those who um, are interested in that particular topic. Uh, just so, you know. um, so at this point, I think I'd like to proceed with the agenda. Uh, as I say, today we're going to be hearing some presentations, being briefed, and then taking a tour to visit sites related to the Corps of Engineers general reevaluation reports for the West Sacramento and the American River uh, Common Features Project. However, before we begin, um, I would like to introduce uh, our good friend, uh, our the mayor of uh, West Sacramento, Chris Cabaldon, uh, to make a few welcoming remarks. He's been very gracious, and he and Marty Tuttle, who is the city manager, have been very helpful in, in making this uh, meeting possible. Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, thank you, Bill. On behalf of the city, I want to welcome the board. I think the last time the board uh, met in plenary session here was when we were, uh, when the governor was considering building a new house on the levee at the confluence of the two rivers, and it didn't go well from a flood perspective, a fundraising perspective, a financial perspective, or anything. And so hopefully today's uh, today's uh, session and tour will be uh, will be more it more will produce more results for all of us. We're really glad that you're here. West Sacramento is is one of those urban flood islands. 
um, in the sense that, th thanks in part to the construction of the system improvements 100 years ago, during uh, the peak flood season, we're completely surrounded by water um, as an urban place. And we are fully, we, we, we didn't move into a floodplain last week. <laughs> this place has been here since pre-Gold Rush, the pre-Gold Rush era, and it is a diverse, very diverse place and a, a center of, of uh, tremendous economic activity for the region and for the state. We are at home to, uh, I think, the, what the, the beat is described as the poorest and most challenging census tract in the region, um, and some of the most exciting dynamic places in the region as well. That's the full the diversity that's captured here. We can't uh, do what we, what we would have done if we were here 100 years ago. We can't decide, well, let's just build in the non floodplain part of our city. It's irresponsible to build in floodplains, so let's build somewhere else. Our whole city is in a floodplain. It's in one floodplain. We have no other options. And if we were to shut down and say, hey, everybody, pick up and we're all moving to the foothills, uh, we would actually it dramatically increase our environmental, the, the, our, our carbon footprint, our environmental impact, um, our environmental injustice issues. Um, and so the, the, the alternatives to us are not, uh, don't involve more responsible floodplain management. We've taken that path. Thanks to your advice and others, we have modified all of our local plans to say we're not expanding. We're not, we had originally thought about moving and expanding to the south and incorporating lands to the north and maybe after buildups, ex you know, expanding, taking over lands to the east. But we're not doing that. Uh, post Katrina, we, we made the judgment that that's, that's, that's bad policy from a variety of perspectives, not just the flood rules but also sustainability and economic uh, growth, and actually have market patterns around interest in moving and living in high quality walkable urban areas as well. So our policies are now all aligned, but we have to provide the protection. Uh, and, uh, and we've been accomplishing that in our, in our own community. Uh, I should say both the protection and the management, of management of risks as well by ourselves and by our residents, and an understanding of the risks that they, that they incur by choosing to live here, raise their families here, and start their start and have a business here as well. And so we've been very aggressive in our education efforts, but also in, in the protection working in partnership with you and the Department of Water Resources and the Corps of Engineers as our, as our central partners in this work. Uh, and so we are, we are working towards the completion of our GRR. We are slightly, slightly we're just trailing behind our, our friends across the river in that work. Uh, but we've already done a significant amount of the work um, uh, on, uh, as part of that process to complete the, our project. So in advance of a GRR or authorization or any federal appropriations, uh, we've already completed miles and miles and miles and miles of legs. We have to do that all, all around the city. Uh, and uh, the, the project that will be, uh, these two of the projects we'll see today are the, the Southport project, which is our, the largest project we've ever undertaken. Six, it's uh, six miles, three and a half miles, which includes setback levees as we try to demonstrate for the region and for the state and really for the country um, how um, uh, modern, 21st century, sustainable, responsible flood protection uh, uh, can be installed in ways that advance multiple objectives in urban places that already unfortunately have homes and, and other uses on them. Uh, that, you know, so we're trying to show that it is possible to accomplish, and it's possible to accomplish within the myriad of state and federal rules that, that uh, many communities have been challenged by. And we're, we're, we're doing that with your help and with the help of our partners, and so we hope you'll be inspired by that project as you see it. If we complete that, uh, and when we complete that project, we'll be just about halfway through um, our entire program under the GRR uh, without having had yet a federal authorization or appropriation. And that's, we, we're pretty proud of that accomplishment as a little town of 50,000 to be able to finance and deliver that project, but it would not have been possible without a very, very tight partnership and, and collaboration with your board and staff, as well as our other partners at the state and the federal, and the federal governments. And so we want, to be, we want to be a pioneer in getting it done, getting it done well, getting it done with local commitment and local participation, but also to demonstrate what 21st century flood protection and flood management looks like in ways that, that uh, can, can provide a model for others in California and across the country for at this time well. So uh, we're, we're, we're glad you're here. We're, we're, we're very proud. We're, we're nervous. We, we hope no events happen on here. We're pretty confident. <laughs> I should also say we're deeply committed to the, to the, to the regional system. Um, even though it is the 100-year-old regional, the regional system in the bypass that's one threat to us, uh, if it weren't for the regional system, we would be having to build a dome over the city as opposed to simply improving our levees. That regional system is really critical. And when Bill was city manager in Sacramento, it was the it was the lore, the mythology in our city that well, if, if, if you know if the river starts getting too big, we'll just send somebody over and they'll blow up the, le the levees on the other side of the river. And they said the same thing. Um, and you know, that was all great. Um, that, that's one way of dealing with the regional impacts of flood improvements. 
but I think you know I've I've tried to remind our, our folks in our own community and in Sacramento that uh, you know after after I've been here I'm going to go have lunch with someone in Sacramento, and uh, you know Dennis might have dropped up his daughter in his home and said child care. Uh, you might be visiting Grandma Church in Yuba City. Uh, you don't know where you'll be or where the people you care about or where your uh, business might be at the point of a flood event. So it's not simply that the regional system you know, helps to divert potential pressure on your own levies. It's that we don't live, nobody lives just in the place where they're registered to vote. Nobody lives their whole lives there. So I'm better, I hope to be protected when I sleep, but I also want to be protected and want people I care about to be protected throughout their day. And that means paying attention to all of the region, all the way up uh, the region as well. So, speaking of the region, I did want to and, and, and just ask if, if uh, our new county supervisor, Oscar Villegas, who represents uh, Yolo County, might come up for just a moment to give a, a big Yolo County welcome as well. Oscar's been a member of the West Sacramento City Council for 13 years, was recently appointed by and then elected, appointed by the governor and then elected by the people in the first district to represent West Sacramento, Clarksburg, and other parts of Yolo County, of course. Some, some might think this place actually still looks familiar to me. It's 13 years I've been spent in here and work uh, on the flood protection, the regional work that's, uh, that's been going on, all the wonderful work that's been going on. It's been a very nice transition of continuing to carry on that real collective, uh, true spirit of working together at the county level. And I just want to introduce Cindy Tuttle and Alex Tengalik, who've been here uh, working on the, on the work and uh, continue to represent the Yolo, Yolo County very well. Uh, looking forward to the briefing, very excited about the prospects that the mayor laid out very clearly uh, the complexity of the work, but uh, I think together as a group we can certainly make make a difference, and it's not about if, it's about when, and so uh, the work continues on, and uh, looking forward to being a, a true partner in, in the work that, uh, that needs to get done, so thank you very much. Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much, uh, Mayor and uh, Supervisor. We appreciate that very much. Uh, isn't the Mayor great? I mean, he really is the only person I know who can justify developing in a floodplain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he actually did that. <laughs> That's very <right>. practical. <laughs> okay, uh, what we want to do now is uh, get into the briefings, and as you know, all of these projects that we've been visiting today are being within the uh, lower Sacramento uh, Delta North uh, Regional Planning Area. And we thought it might be helpful to give the board, as well as those in attendance, a context for how these projects are actually going to work within that overall planning system. And I think um, Eric Nagy of the uh, MBK is going to present the uh, uh, progress report on the status report of the lower Sacramento Delta North uh, planning effort. So, uh, Eric. Thank you, uh, President Edgar, uh, members of the board, uh, agency representatives, uh, elected officials, and members of the public. My name is Eric Nagy, and I work with MBK engineers. Uh, and today I've been um, given the charge to explain really how four um, separate and distinct planning efforts can occur in one region and actually result in recommendations that are compatible. Um, over the last months and years, I've had the good fortune of working on all four of these planning efforts. The Regional Flood Management Plan for the Lower Sacramento Delta North uh, region, the Integrated Water Management Plan for the Yola Bypass and Cash Slough Complex, uh, the West Sacramento General Reevaluation Report and the Common Features General Reevaluation Report. And when you really think about um, the region, um, we're talking about some massive <coughs> recommendations for improving our flood system, but doing it in a way that equally considers many other competing objectives. So here really what I'm going to do, and I'm going to try to do this very quickly because I know we'd all like to get out in the field, um, is to provide a quick update on the status of the regional plan, uh, introduce or reintroduce to some the topic of the integrated water management plan for the Yolo Bypass and Cash Slough area, and then talk about how all these things are compatible with one another and how the recommendations really are coming up. 
to be very consistent. Next slide. When you consider the regional setting, um, the Lower Sac region is a real tinderbox in a lot of ways. Um, the, the urban development, um, the assets that are within the region represent 70% of the estimated annual damages that are protected by the state plan of flood control facilities. So it's absolutely critical that we figure out regionally how to, um, for a lot of reasons, for life safety and for economic viability, how do we protect those assets, but we've got to do it smartly. And part of that, um, how do we do it smartly, comes down to this set of competing interests that we have. Uh, the Yolo Bypass in this part of the region has really become the apple in a lot of people's eyes. Um, they see the Yolo Bypass as a means to address uh, a lot of single purpose uh, or single objective project needs. And really, we just don't have the space or capacity to satisfy all those needs looking one objective at a time. We have to really focus on means to integrate those objectives and implement them in ways that are compatible with one another. And really, um, I think those competing objectives primarily are three things. Uh, and there, there are others, certainly, but I think the three that, that we talk about or spend the most time talking about are how do we improve our system's ability to convey floodwaters in a reliable way, one. Two, how do we enhance the environment and our ecology uh, and our ecosystem so that we can you know, better protect um, and ensure the viability over the long term of uh, our ecosystem? And three, how do we sustain um, an agricultural economy that's viable and vibrant and so important to the region? And, and while many people think of the uh, agricultural uh, economy is important to the state of California, it's very important to this region as well. And that's really evidenced by the land use. When you look at the land use in this regional plan area, there is a significant amount of acreage that is devoted to agriculture. And that amount of, um, that land use for agriculture far outweighs the urban development and the native lands, or the lands that are in, essentially in native status. Uh, our regional flood management plan is coming to a close. Um, the Lower Sacramento Delta North plan will be delivered to Department of Water Resources the 21st of this month. So we are wrapping up that effort and we're starting to engage and work towards our next steps. Um, that plan has, as you would expect, a significant number of recommendations related to flood risk reduction. Um, and those recommendations span across the different, um, both rural and urban settings that I just previously mentioned. Uh, but it also includes opportunities for conservation and conservation opportunities that can be bundled with these flood risk reduction projects in a manner that allows us to create um, multi-benefit um, project implementation opportunities where we're not just solving a flood control problem or a flood protection problem, we're also enhancing the environment. This process has really been um, quite special in that it's re resulted in a concept for an integrated water management plan for the Yolo Bypass. And, and probably everybody in the audience knows how much attention the Yolo Bypass has been getting the last couple of years and how many people have ideas, their own ideas, for how to do different things in the Yolo Bypass. And as a region, I think we've really, um, to the credit of a lot of folks that have been working in this region over the last couple of years on this topic, I think we've really taken on that responsibility in trying to figure out how can we do this in a way that can work for everybody. And the Integrated Water Management Plan, I'll touch on more in a second. But just quickly, in terms of our, our regional flood management plan schedule, as I indicated, it, it will go to DWR on the 21st. Uh, it's currently undergoing its final review, and um, the final public meeting will be it is scheduled for uh, August 18th. And so that will be an opportunity to engage with many or all the folks that provided us input and say, here's what your input resulted in. And here's where we're headed next. Next slide. 
the integrated water management plan concept is, is really built around for us to be successful in the Yolo Bypass, there cannot be winners and losers. If there are winners and losers, we will simply all fail together. And so instead of all failing together, let's all get better together. And so that's really what the plan, the concept for that plan is built around. How do we take a collection of element, plan elements and put them together in a way that we can show how, how we can all collectively get better as land use agencies, as flood protection agencies, uh, from an economic point of view and from an environmental point of view. And oh, by the way, how do we figure out how to make it easier to operate and maintain this stuff going forward? Because it's something that we all struggle with, is how do we, in a sustainable way, operate and maintain the facilities that we already have in the flood protection system? It's very difficult to do. And so anything that we do from a, the standpoint of improvement of those facilities has to consider how we make operations and maintenance easier, more sustainable, more cost effective. Uh, the goals of the IWMP, um, you know, are really, um, there's really five primary goals. Uh, some of them I've already touched on. How do, we, how do we improve the flood system, not just locations within the flood system? How do we improve the system itself? How do we um, ensure the ability to sustain a viable um, and robust agricultural economy in the region? How do we conserve or expand um, high value habitat for critical species? <coughs> How do we better um, coordinate our plans for flood protection with water supply? And, and what I just mentioned, more sustainable uh, means to operate and maintain the flood system that we, that we have and that we are wanting to uh, create. The plan elements for the IWMP include a, a mixture um, of both physical improvements, suggested physical improvements, as well as uh, policy initiatives. Um, as, you, as you might imagine, trying to modernize the Yolo Bypass and transform it into um, something that was originally conceived you know, over 100 years ago into something that we can live with for the next 100 years is going to require both things. And so, um, you know, examples of uh, each of those two um, types of plan elements on the physical improvement side, looking at extending the Fremont Weir and setting back levees in different parts of the Yolo Bypass not only to improve um, the ability to convey flood water, but to create those opportunities for environmental enhancement, but do it in a way that doesn't, um, doesn't impact agriculture, and in fact, maybe creates opportunities to enhance agriculture. And we really think that that's, that's possible to do. It's, it's tough work, it's, um, it's certainly not easy, and it certainly isn't, um, it's certainly more difficult than trying to formulate a single objective project, but we are convinced that it's the only way that we that we can really get off the ground with meaningful change in the Yolo Bypass. One of the uh, policy elements is is trying to um, identify sort of innovative ways to look at existing uh, FEMA floodplain regulation, uh, as opposed to trying to figure out a means to uh, change FEMA's statute or policies or guidance, how can we work collaboratively with FEMA and, and look at the existing floodplain designations and how they interpret those floodplain designations and, and, and sort of challenge some of those interpretations in a way that benefits agricultural communities. We know, we know that um, many agricultural communities will not achieve uh, protection against the base flood. And so how do we create um, an interpretation or, or, or some different views on those policies that allow those agricultural communities to not necessarily expand, but just remain viable? The, um, the RFMP that will be uh, delivered to DWR later this month includes an introduction to the um, integrated water management plan concept, as you know, a lot of people um, are aware it, it you know when you when you kind of move forward with such a, um, a visionary concept I guess for modernization of a bypass system in the catch slough area you know there's a lot of hesitancy with sort of how you describe it and you know who gets to hear about it first 
and so we're very we're being very careful. We have a coalition uh, of local agencies that has been really investing a tremendous amount of effort in coming up with a concept that we think can work, and um, that coalition is delicate. And we want to make sure that it continues to that those that trust and those relationships continue to develop, and that that commitment is um, kind of continues to deepen before you know we roll the plan out um, to too you know too far too broadly um, with those concepts. And so the RFMP does include an introduction to it. We've engaged the Department um, of Water Resources fully the last few months in the concept and are um, buttoned up uh, top to bottom coordinating regularly with the department on how do we advance this concept. There's no way that this happens without the department's not only full buy-in but participation. Um, uh, they need to be at the table with us every step of the way and they, and they have been. They've been a tremendous partner in the development of the regional flood management plan and they are continuing to be a great partner as we move forward with um, the development of the integrated water management. Uh, you know, th th this is, I think this is a perfect, um, this is a perfect picture of what we're trying to do. Um, that's a mess up there. And, and, and you know, day to day, it, it generally feels like a mess that we're dealing with. But, but it's really important that you know for us all to recognize that planning at different levels of government, various efforts can all happen, um, and but be done in a way that it's well coordinated. And so, when you think about this region, you know, you have two massive studies that are going to be presented by the core here in a couple minutes that probably recommend $3 billion worth of, of investment in the flood system. Uh, the RFMP has another couple billion probably. Um, you know, we're talking about massive amounts of, of resources um, that collectively we have to commit are the right decision for this region at this time. And so, you know, really what that slide to me is about is about the need to coordinate and to communicate. Um, and to make sure that no one effort gets too far off on its own without checking back in with the other, other efforts to ensure continuity and consistency. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, and this is a little bit difficult to see in this uh, room, but the green, the, the bright green line is the regional planning boundary, and there are uh, three actually four federal studies that are happening within that regional plan boundary. Two that we'll hear about today, uh, Common Features and West Sacramento General Reevaluation Reports. There's also the Lower Cache Creek uh, Feasibility Study over in uh, the Yolo County uh, backyard. And then uh, what's not shown is the Central Valley Integrated Flood Management Study, SIVMS, which I know the board's and uh, heard presentations on before. And that actually has the exact same footprint as the Sacramento River Basin-wide feasibility study. And so you can look at the four efforts that are happening at the uh, federal level, and then you also say, you look over to DWR, and there's a basin-wide feasibility study going on, and then there's a regional uh, flood management study going on, and then, oh, by the way, there's a whole bunch of others that are thinking about different ways to use this region as well. You know, it really, it really speaks to my previous point about um, the importance of communication and collaboration across the agency. Next slide. So really, you know, in terms of how do these um, studies, how, how, how do we know they're compatible? Um, well, it, the proof's really in the recommendations, right? And, and so when you look at the Regional Flood Management Plan, it, it, it encompasses essentially um, a majority of the features uh, that are recommended in both the West Sacramento and Common Features GRRs. The couple features that are not explicitly recommended in the RMMP are included explicitly in the Integrated Water Management Plan. And so between the two regional planning efforts that are underway, all of the recommendations that are made by the Corps are encompassed uh, within that, that regional, uh, that, those regional planning efforts. And there's strong regional support. I mean, we all recognize that you know the urban areas uh, certainly um, 
deserve better flood protection than they have, and the region recognizes that in Holden. So um, there's the, the RFMP project team is strongly supportive of both of the recommended plans. I think the last point that, that I would make is, um, you know, in a lot of ways the paradigm, planning paradigm particularly, has shifted. Um, maybe over, well, certainly um, since probably around 2005. And that is, you know, I think most of us used to expect the core to come into town, do a massive planning effort, make some recommendations and address the problems. And, with um, you know the tremendous investment that the state is making in its own flood system, uh, in partnership with the local agencies, we've really kind of flipped that upside down. You know, the core now is making some some very specific recommendations in study areas that are a subset of these larger planning regions and basin-wide studies that the state and the locals are, are working in partnership on. And so, you know, whereas um, you know, we would, we would often, I think, wrestle a little bit with the core to try to get the recommendations right-sized and, and consistent with the needs of local government and, and the state government. You know, now we, there's a tremendous opportunity for us in the regional planning processes and in the basin wide planning processes through the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan to address some of those local issues that the core and the federal government in general really isn't well positioned to address. And so, you know, I think the, the you know, we certainly want to um, continue to, to build the partnership and relationship with the federal government from a funding point of view, from a policy point of view, um, from the standpoint of, um, you know, having that long-term partner that, that we've had for a long time and should continue to have for a long time. But we need to also recognize that there might we just might be better positioned ourselves to address some of the, the local and, and state level issues and, and not try to burden the core process with those. Uh, and I think that's really what we're doing in the Lower Sacramento Delta North region. I think we've really, through the development of the Integrated Water Management Plan and the Regional Flood Management Plan, are tackling some of those issues head on, recognizing that we probably can't get the core there, and, and more should we try to get the core there, and this might not be the most efficient route. So with that, um, that was my presentation. I don't know if we're going to wait till the end to do questions, or we should just get into the next presentation. I, I think uh, we'll hold the questions, Eric, and pick up mine sure. until we do the others. The only comment I would have is um, I think you're right in terms of the paradigm has changed from the core doing the projects and we're influencing to the change where we're driving the process, state and the local governments are driving the process. We used to talk about the big disconnect in this flood control system between the people who run it and the people who give land use entitlements. Cities and counties give land use entitlements and the state and the feds run the system. And this shift is in fact changed that where we're going to be able to connect uh, the entitlement process and uh, the running of the system. And what I would, uh, as you're coming to a conclusion in this planning effort, make sure that the cities and the counties are on board as entities because those are the ones that develop the public growth policy, the general plans of public policy on how they want to develop. So ultimately what you're looking at are these regional flood plans somehow being integrated into their general plans in the public safety elements of those plans. And then there would be that connection with the regulatory means and at the local level everybody being knowledgeable about what's allowed in the floodplain, what isn't, what we're trying to do, and so on. That, that disconnect that you and I and everybody else in this room has experienced over a long period of time will, will be resolved, and that will be in the public interest. So that, that's, that's kind of where we're headed with these regional plans, and it's a, I think it's a credit to the state, the department, who funded the local planning efforts. I think that was a huge, huge step forward. Um, and I, 
I'm not sure they recognized it when they did it, but it, yeah, I think it's really paid off big time. Okay, at this point, we'll hold the questions for a little bit. And at this point, Andrew Muha of the Corps of Engineers is going to give us a little presentation on the general reevaluation report for West Sacramento. Andrew. Well, thank you, Mike. Well, I appreciate the introduction, and Eric, thank you for your presentation. I'm Andrew Muha. I'm a wild resource planner with the Army Corps of Engineers. I work on both the West Sacramento GRR and the American River Common Future GRR. Which one thing I want to highlight is that since these projects are so closely tied in such a big project in the region, many of the team members on both of the projects are the same. So we've been integrating our studies together and doing and with all the same people. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And then also we've been working closely with the state and our local partners to move these projects forward. Okay, so the presentation objectives I want to give a brief presentation of some of the findings we found for our study that's led to our selection of the tentatively plan. We want to present some of the features of the tentatively selected plans for both the West Sac GRR and the American River Common Future Project. We also want to highlight the next steps that will lead from where we are now, which is on the West Sac side, we're getting to release of the public draft of the report, and ultimately through the core process to a chief's report, and then eventually authorization of the project by Congress. So the next slide. Yeah, and as the mayor and others have stated, we're in a critical area here. We're located at the confluence of two rivers, the American River and the Sacramento River, and our cities are located within the floodplains of those rivers. Uh, as you can see, there's we have divided the area into four basins. There's the Natomas Basin, the American River North Basin, the American River South Basin, and then the West Sacramento Basin. As you share that, that the that picture depicts the depth of flooding associated with a 500-year event. Also on that picture, to the west of West Sacramento and to the north of West Sacramento would be the full Sacramento Bypass and Yolo Bypass. So you can just see how impacted we are by flood events. And with the population, you know, and also, you know, the population, we have a lot of population in the area and critical federal and government state facilities. So the impacts of those would have serious consequences. So the next slide kind of shows kind of the damages that could be, this slide are the consequences of a levee failure associated with a 200 year event. Again, just kind of moving up in the Thomas Basin, there's 100,000 people with about 23,000 structures. The damages associated with that event could be about $6.3 billion. In the American River North, 78,000 people, 15,000 structures, and about 4.8 billion in damages. The American River South has 450,000 people, 68,000 structures, and 12.7 billion in damages. And also in that area is, the, of course, the state capital and many, and many government facilities. And impacts of those facilities could impact the area for a long time, both state and regional, along with the government facilities and the transportation routes that could be impacted with that. And then the last basin is, of course, the West Sacramento Basin. 48,000 people live within that basin, about 18,000 structures, with about $3.8 billion in damages. Okay, next slide. All right, a geotech, both based on our geotechnical and hydraulic analysis, we've determined that, you know, the levee failure modes best from the highest risk driver to the least are through and under seepage, slope stability, erosion, and overtopping. Now, as you know, many of the, most of the levees constructed in the Sacramento Valley were constructed by dredge materials coming out of the river. So these are not engineered, engineered levees at all. Um, so they weren't engineered designs, so we need to improve those levees. But with the evolving standards we've had, that we've had since the 1997 flood, that indicated how much of a problem we have with under seepage. Now, we've done some improvements based you know, to address those, but they haven't been enough to meet the current standards that, we're, that are developing for levee construction. So one of the things with this project is to address these worst risk drivers first and to get the most bang for our buck when we're trying to fix the levees, improve the levees. All right, the next slide. Okay, so this gets us up to the West Sacramento GRR and the tentatively selected plan. As I mentioned, 
we are going out with a public draft report on July 18th, so next Friday is when that report is going to be for public release. And the tentatively selected plan includes improving the levees in place and also using and also incorporating the Southport setback levy, which is the current EIPD developed by Wasafka and the state. Okay, the levy improvements we're going to have are to seepage instability are going to be addressed uh, with slurry cutoff walls or seepage burns. Erosion protection will be predominantly bank protection, but we could use some uh, rock trenches in some specific areas. And then the levy raises will be incorporated to increase the capacity of the conveyance. And then the setback levy and salvage work will be utilized to address levy concerns and will also increase riparian habitat. Um, we have divided that, and also we have divided the section into a number of reaches. This is a, this is Sacramento River North Reach, the Port North Levy Reach, the Yolo Bypass Reach, and then the Sac Bypass Reach, and then this is the Sac Bypass Training Dike, and then for the South Basin we have the, the South Port Reach, the South Cross Levy, the Deepwater Ship Channel, and then the Port South Levy. And then also we have what is currently the navigation levy, which we call the Deepwater Ship Channel West Levy, that extends on the west side of the Deepwater Ship Channel. But more importantly for this study, it's on the east side of the Yolo Bypass, so it also provides flood risk management benefits for the city of West Sacramento. And that, that actually extends about 18 miles south of the South Cross Levy. And another thing that's going to be part of this study, including those improvements, if this is the stone lock area, that's a lock that was used to connect uh, the Sacramento River to the deep water ship channel. We're going to plug that, plug the stone lock with a levee, with a, a levee that will essentially connect the Sacramento River North and Sacramento River South levees to have one continuous levee. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a cross-section, a representative cross-section of the Southport setback levy, and this will be our first stop on the tour or later this morning. Okay, the, left, the, the Southport setback levy is going to be about three and a half miles of the Southport reach. It's going to be set back between two to four hundred feet from the river. As you can see, this schematic shows that this is the existing levy now, and the existing levee will be degraded a bit, but the, the uh, waterside vegetation will be maintained. And then this area here, the offcut area, will be degraded to allow for water to flow through and to also allow for riparian plantings. And then the new levee will be built, like I said, two to 400 feet eastward of the, exi of the, of the existing levee. And that will be built with either a setback levee uh, it is, I mean, it'll be a seepage berm or a cutoff wall, or both in some, in, in most instances, it'll be both. And again, we're going to be stopping at that, that area, that'll be our first stop, and we can answer more questions regarding that at that stop. Uh, the next one. All right, so this is, this is also discussing another factor that we're being considered in, in this study. This is the deep water ship channel. Now the Deepwater Ship Channel was constructed in the 1960s and it breached the existing levee, which we now call the Deepwater Ship Channel East Levee and the Yolo Bypass, to enter the, the, the port of West Sacramento in the Turning Basin. This has been considered a navigation levee since that time, but it does, as we discussed, um, provide flood risk management for the city of West Sacramento because during high flood events, there can be 500,000 cubic feet or more of water flowing through the Yolo Bypass. So it's critical to protect this levee to, to, to improve it, to avoid possible backwater effects from a breach in that levee that could impact the city of West Sacramento. And so as part of the project, we're going to recommend that that become a project levee within the Sacramento River Flood Control. I think that is it for me, and I would like to introduce Sarah Schultz. She is the lead planner on the uh, American River Common Features DRR.
All right, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sarah Schultz. I'm a water resources planner for the Board of Engineers um, in the Sacramento District. And I will be um, speaking to you specifically about the features of the American River Common Features Study. Um, as Andrew um, introduced, we have very similar problems for American River as we do for the West Sacramento project. So a lot of our levy improvements are very similar as well. I'd like to run through them specifically as they relate to the Common Features Study. So our ten tentatively selected plan includes levy improvements for the American River South Basin, the American River North Basin, and also includes a widening of the Sacramento bypass. At this time, we are not including additional recommendations in the Natomas Basin. Um, the the uh, project that was recently authorized by Congress in Order 14 includes uh, work that will be um, initiated in Natomas. So we do not have further recommendations for the Natomas Basin at this time. Uh, what we are recommending is citizen stability improvements along the Sacramento River, about 13 miles of those, and about 10 miles of erosion protection along those same reaches. We have about, um, actually under one mile of levee rays down in the very southern portion of the study area. Um, and then on the American River, we have about 11 miles of erosion protection that we are recommending there. Um, about four miles on the right bank and about seven miles on the south bank or the left bank, and I'll have some additional slides with details on those later. Um, other than tributaries on Arcade Creek um, and on the Nemtech, we have about four miles of seepage and stability improvements and about five miles of flood wall rates that we're recommending in that area, um, with some improvements for the Magpie Creek area as well. And then lastly, I'd like to highlight the Sacramento Bypass, where we are um, recommending a widening of the Weir and Bypass. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, on this image, we have a conceptual drawing of here's the existing Sacramento Bypass, and what we are recommending is construction of a new weir, and then a new levee with a seepage berm about 1,500 feet to the north. Um, we would degrade the existing levee and the benefit of this bypass widening is that it allows additional water into the bypass area, thereby reducing the water surface elevation or the flood stage in the river as it passes by the cities of Sacramento and West Sacramento. So it provides a benefit out in the river for doing that. Next slide, please. So I'd like to get in now to a little bit more of the, the specific analysis that we did on the American River to determine the extent of the uh, erosion problem on the river. Um, we are not recommending any more seepage or stability improvements on the American River. Those have been addressed by the Board of 96 and 99 projects. The remaining um, issue that needs to be addressed on the American River is um, erosion potential. So um, the studies have shown us that um, the American River is degrading. Um, this is partly due to the presence of Folsom Dam upstream, which traps a lot of sediment. We also have a lot of very erosive materials in the river channel itself, from hydraulic mining debris, but also just naturally occurring erodible sands and silt. And so the river has been degrading down recently, but it is soon going to be hitting this blue layer, which is more resistant to erosion. So what, what's going to happen when it reaches that is it's going to stop degrading down and it's going to start eroding laterally. And that is basically the where our parkway is right now. It's where the berms of the parkway are and then these are the levees. So as the river starts to erode out, it's going to start eating away at the berms and potentially at the levees themselves. Uh, next slide. Uh, the American River is also relatively steep compared to other rivers in the valley, um, steep from Folsom Dam down to the confluence. It's about um, twice as steep as the Sacramento River specifically um, in the levee portions of the American River, which is between River Mile 5 and River Mile 10. This graphic up on the screen is a velocity contour map at a flow of about 160,000 CFS coming down the American 
Um, that's a very high flow. Uh, what we're seeing is the contour colors range from the zero feet in the, in the purple and goes up to about 12 feet per second in the red color. This is the area, this is Sac State in this general area, and this is um, um, Len Hall Park and River Park right here. So just to give you an orientation, the Guy West Bridge is approximately in this location, and we're going to be visiting that site later on our tour, so you'll be able to see this area on the ground later this morning. Um, so this is a real cause of concern in terms of just the, the high velocities that we're seeing in the river channel there, right up against the banks, and also the levees in, in that specific area. So this the steepness of the river channel combined with the constriction of the channel in this area has, has led to erosion or concern about potential erosion occurring. So our recommendations really focus on this levee breach of the American River between River Mile 5 and River Mile 10. Next slide. So these are um, two of the potential methods that we would be employing to address the erosion potential. The top one is what we are calling our launchable trench scenario. And this would be used in areas where there is very sensitive um, riparian habitat right up against the river, in areas that we, we really didn't want to touch that uh, exact river bank. And also if, if we had a spot where we didn't have a lot of vegetation right on the levee itself, we would construct this trench, basically digging out at the toe, waterside toe of the levee, and backfilling it with rock material. The idea is that as the river starts to erode away the bank, it would then um, basically open up this rock trench, and the, the rock would then launch during a flood event and armor the bank to prevent additional erosion from occurring. The second um, method that we are showing down here is what we're calling more of a bank protection scenario. This is a method that the Sacramento River Bank Protection Project has employed. Um, it looks at um, um, bank armory right on the bank itself. And the, and the benefit of this one is, is that it will, would preserve the bank um, before the erosion basically eroded it away. And so this would be our, our preferable method in areas where we could employ this. Um, we would refine exactly where these different methods would be employed during our design phase. So, next slide, please. So, this is a series of photographs which shows the installation of a rock trench, and we will see this site later on this morning. This is also near the Guy West Bridge. So, basically, in the top photograph, you can see how the trench was excavated and then backfilled with the rock, and then at the end of the project, it's covered with soil and then hydro seeded. So when we go out there um, later this morning, it, it's almost difficult to tell exactly where it is. Next slide, please. And then this is an example of our other method, the, the rock, uh, the Zach Bank style um, bank protection, whereby rock is placed on the bank itself. And in this site, um, a soil lens was allowed or left within the middle of the, of the rock um, area and willows and other sort of um, native vegetation was allowed in that soil lens and then it was covered up with rock. And so you can see how the vegetation has come up, grown up through the rock um, to also assist with that armor. And so this is a nice progression you can see over almost 10 years how that vegetation has grown up. And we will see this site later. Next slide, please. So uh, stepping back again to how both of these studies would be implemented. For both of these studies, we looked at where um, the greatest risk was. And that risk is based on what's the probability of a levee failure multiplied by the consequences if a levee failure were to occur. And so as Andrew had mentioned before, West Sacramento has been broken up into study reaches. The common feature study area has been broken up into reaches. And so we have basically a ranked order of all of our reaches for both studies. What is the greatest risk? Let's I target those first and buy down that risk as fast as we can in that order that addresses worst first. Um, and we would do this in a way to protect other resources, be mindful of the environmental recreational 
educational resources out there. And then as we move into design, we look at ways to minimize those impacts and, and maximize the cost effectiveness. And for both of our studies, um, our sponsors are moving out on Section 408 um, applications to start to address those worst first areas. So for both SAC, uh, West Sac and Common Features. So that sort of gets to the point Eric was alluding to earlier in terms of that, that shift. Uh, responsibilities or action. So um, looking at our schedule, moving out from here, um, as Andrew mentioned, we are working on um, our draft reports and the West Sacramento report will be released for public review next Friday, July 18th, and there is um, a public meeting scheduled here in this building actually on August 19th during that um, public review period. The Common Features Study is um, about a month out. We're looking for a release of our uh, draft document in the August timeframe. And then concurrent with that public review, we will initiate our technical and policy review within our agency and um, coordination, in coordination with the sponsors. And that will um, most likely run through the fall. And then next winter and spring, we will be finalizing our reports and then targeting to have the reports ready to go before a Civil Works Review Board in, in Washington, D.C. at our headquarters building uh, uh, probably next spring or summer. So that would be the endorsement by the core of our recommended plan. And after that recommendation, then this uh, final report would go out for our state agency review. Um, once those comments are compiled and there's endorsement, um, we would compile the chief's report in conjunction with our headquarters office, and then that chief's report would basically be a recommendation to Congress uh, for um, the two recommended plans. And then we would need to wait for an additional word. So um, that's basically my presentation. Um, I'll hand it back over to Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah uh, and Andrew. That was uh, very good. Uh, we'll have a couple of time for or a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions they'd like to, uh, Emma. When did the environmental documents get prepared? They are being prepared right now. Yeah, concurrently. Concurrently. So when you go to the board review, then. Yeah, so both of um, the, the, the environmental documents for both studies are being prepared concurrently. They will be released for public review in, um, well, for West Sac, it will start next week. For Common Features, it will start in August. Um, we will receive public comments, and those public comments will be addressed and then um, incorporated into the final document next year. And then um, the, the final document, we, we would look for approval of the NEPA and CEQA documents probably in the spring and summer time frame of next year. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Okay, any comments from the public? Make sure uh, before we adjourn uh, that you sign the waivers and sign in for <laughs> the staff. Again, uh, Nancy has those if, if you need them. Now we're going to uh, <coughs> start our specific site visits uh, in a minute. We're going to go to the Southport Levy Improvement Project. Then we're going to come back here for a, a rest break. Then there's going to be a site visit to the American River um, Features um, common features project on the job site. We're going to look at two things there. One is the jet grabbing slurry uh, wall construction on the American River near Howe Avenue. Uh, and then we're going to go to the uh, Guy West Bridge. Uh, uh, Dave McDaniel will give us a little briefing and so we'll keep guilty. Then we'll return here hopefully around uh, 1 o'clock or so. So any questions about that? Okay, I think we'll adjourn to the buses.